All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Um, we're excited today to be hosting three individuals who are working to ground spiritual practices in our current political realities to cope with and fight oppression. Uh, Firestorm's a 16-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective uh, in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. And we strive to feature events uh, and books that reflect our values, our interests, and the needs of marginalized people in the South. We're also continuing to book a lot of our virtual events, um, both because uh, we like to expand the accessibility of our programming, and it also allows us to connect with authors and speakers who um, might not make it uh, into our little region of the world. Um, if you're interested in keeping up with our future events, I would encourage you to follow us on social media um, or sign up for our somewhat infrequent newsletter. Um, I'll put links for both in the chat. And um, just so you know, our next virtual event is going to be on August 27th, and it's going to be a discussion on Black liberation and prisoner support in the context of uh, Black August. So, um, Today we are using a uh, Zoom webinar, um, which if you haven't used it before, um, is a little finicky. There's a, a, a Q and A tool, probably if you're on a computer at the bottom of your screen, I think maybe on phone, it's at the top. It looks like two little speech bubbles. Um, and I would encourage you to, as we go, uh, type out any questions that you might have for the panelists today. Uh, we're gonna make an effort to set aside some time at the end to, um, uh, pick out some questions um, to tackle. Uh, there's also an open chat. Um, the folks who are uh, speaking today are probably not gonna be actively engaged in that chat while they're speaking, but um, but feel free to, to share things there if you care to. Uh, all right, so we're gonna get started here. Uh, I'll share some quick bios for our panelists. Uh, Lane Smith is a transmasculine, non-binary writer with over 20 years of experience as an activist, organizer, and terror reader. They've been involved in struggles against war, the death penalty, attacks on LGBT rights and bodily autonomy for marginalized genders and birthing people, police violence, and apartheid. Uh, they've worked as a social worker in prisons and in the field of harm reduction with people who are at risk for HIV, AIDS. Uh, with a professional master's degree in social work and an academic master's degree in humanities and social thought, Lane expresses their ideas in clear, non-academic language in the interest of putting social justice values into practice. Uh, Lane is the editor of uh, Tarot and Politics Zine and a member of Solidarity Tarot, where they live in Baltimore City, Maryland, one of my favorite cities on the East Coast. Um, and so here's Lane's book right here, if you don't already have a copy of it. Um, Christopher Marmalejo is a brown, queer, and trans writer, um, diviner, and educator. They use divination to promote a literacy of liberation. They were born and raised in San Bernardino, California, among the Pines, in community with the um, uh, Mariam or Serrano people, with nine plus years of experience as a trained educator focused on cultivating classrooms of emancipatory possibility. Uh, they work with students around the world to plant and nurture the seed of divinatory practice, finally weaving tarot, astrology, curanderismo with critical decolonial black queer feminist epistemology. And here is Christopher's beautiful book. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Sarah Calvaris is a South Philadelphia based uh, author, illustrator, astrologer, Tarot reader and former owner of the Eighth House, a brick and mortar retail space. She left her career in chemistry and engineering in 2020 to pursue full time creative work. Her projects to date include the Eighth House Tarot, an astrological tarot deck, uh, Prism Tarot, Mundane Magic Tarot, Stories, a collaborative oracle deck, and Magic IRL, an interactive tarot and astrology book. Friends, thanks so much for being here with us today. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you, Lane. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it's awesome to be in the firestorm space for me as, you know, as a radical. I'm 45 years old. I've been in radical spaces for the past 25 years. 
And it is so exciting to me to be talking about tarot in a radical space like this, where for up until the last maybe three to five years, I felt like tarot was a taboo subject in such political spaces. I really personally felt it was something I had to hide um, from my comrades all of that time. There's such disdain for anything spiritual, mystical, um, oftentimes in, in political spaces. And I just love that that divide is, is bursting apart <laughs> um, as of this moment, because I think, you know, especially in the past year, um, people are really seeing what a spiritual crisis we're all in um, with what's happening, the genocide in Palestine. There's no question, the words that come up, you know, I'm horrified by the moral apathy. Where are people's moral compass? Where do you find hope? These are spiritual questions, right? And so like, I just really um, wanted to take the opportunity of my book release, it comes out tomorrow, to platform some of the um, brilliant, wise, politically engaged and conscious um, spiritual folks, tarot practitioners um, that I know just because for so long, I feel like, and still there's this stereotype of people who engage in magical practice as being not very smart or being really gullible or being really like out there and not in touch with reality. And I just, the one, the people that I know are not like that. I know that that stereotype is there for a reason. And there's a reason why like QAnon was able to make such inroads with like anti-vax and all this stuff, um, you know, right-wing stuff in spiritual spaces. But I just really felt like there are so many radical spiritual folks too. And there's like, it's ripe for even more and deeper radicalization. And so I just, I really wanted um, everyone to know and see <laughs> the, the brilliant, wise, um, radical minds of, of people that I know like Christopher and Sarah, and so, so, so many more, more people um, define the stereotype. Even when I was trying to find a publisher for 78 Acts of Liberation, like there were tarot publishers who were like, this is too academic or intellectual for our audiences. And I was like, that's really insulting that you think about that about your own audience. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just like, we're, smart people who know about science and we know about politics and we do have a grasp of the real of historical materialism of all of that i promise you um so i just i wanted to really um show you show people that and and um and also help spiritual folks to be more confident in in saying that and showing that and i just think um the works that we have among us today really do show that i mean especially um christopher's book is just so so rich and so beautiful and is so full of um history culture lived experience all of the things that could not be more grounded in reality and then I absolutely love um, Sarah's deck. Of course, like a 90s zine aesthetic, I'm gonna love it. But it's it just the way that the, the material culture of tarot, like it, it feels like it reminds you that these materials could be in your hands, that you're assembling them um, as, as you're reading. It's not sort of this, painting that you get lost in this fantasy it's it's really it's like brings to the forefront like I'm creating this as I'm going as I'm reading I'm creating the meaning here and it's a conversation and it's fluid and I think that's what's sort of common between all of us is that we recognize the the complexity and the dialectics and all of that of history and culture and spirit and and all of these things of just being human um it's it's dense and complex and we can hold it all and we do. So um, thank you so much for joining me in conversation today. I'm really honored to have you all with me. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm honored and glad to be here. I'm happy to help celebrate this massive accomplishment of 
producing a book into the world and to be sitting here with, you know, both of you who are so fantastic and um, know kind of also the struggle of creating and working with tarot, you know, and, and like <laughs> going through the 78 archetypes, having the the thread that we're trying to weave and put forth is um, is dense and it is complicated. And so I'm happy to be here and in conversation with y'all. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to be here with both of you. I have both of your books, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially Christopher, reading the conclusion to your book, especially is sort of what like sparked me to want to make this conversation happen through Firestorm in particular. It's just, I just feel like connecting with material reality with like real possibility and, um, using divination in a way that connects with lessons from our histories. I think we're used to doing that with our personal experiences. Like if you read for a really long time, your personal history is collecting around certain cards, right? You like mm -hmm. draw this card, you're like, Jesus Christ, this card always fucking comes up when I'm in a relationship or when a relationship is ending or what, like memories become collected around various cards, which informs their meaning to you. And there's also collective meanings that are imbued in the cards that are helping you interpret that for your own personal life. And I just think, you know, stepping way back to look at history and culture, like why not also, like we draw on the lessons of our own personal history is why not also be able to draw on the lessons of history and culture. Um, right. And I just, you know, during lockdown, it, during 2020, I just, I felt like history was becoming so flattened and like, it, it just felt like this weight of like, this is an end of history. Like everything is going to be before and after this. Mm -hmm. Right. And I just felt like so much before was getting lost and forgotten. And I was like, I need to not forget. Like I mm -hmm. need to have Tahrir Square attached to something that perpetually comes back up in my life that's not necessarily just the news cycle, right? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Like, I want to remember what we learned from that time and what we felt during that time, especially. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. So that that's part of the impetus for, for my book was sort of just like not to lock these particular um, historical moments in people's minds as attached to these cards as like new correspondences, but just how do you incorporate um, <clears throat> history and culture and social movements and everything as part of the context that you're drawing from um, in thinking through your, your own life. And I know, um, I think, Christopher, you have a, a similar approach and obviously our lives have been very, very different, different identities, different cultures, different everything. Um, and so our books look really different. Mine is pretty like spare and um, I don't know, I, I tried to really, uh, I have almost like a sort of mathematical approach. And then yours is so dense and lush and um, just, Gosh, reading about the your tower chapter and your experience of the of the fire, um, it just it's so deeply moving and so um, it just grabs you. It's so intimate. That's the word I'm looking for. It's so intimate. Like I feel like I bring a very zoomed out, like let's look across history kind of thing. And yours is so intimate, and I just love um, the compliment the the way our books complement each other and being so different in that way. I I totally agree, and I so. Um... And thank you. I mean, that's such a compliment. I think it's always hard to like, um, it's also with writing a book or making like a big project that like anything related to tarot is going to be like a big project to get a sense of like the scope of it all. Even as we're talking about history, it's hard to like, I was like, okay, having to trust my own process with the end product, of like the goal of red tarot and, and wanting to exactly do what you're saying, like, at, um, associate for me, you know, prophets of liberation, um, spiritualists, radicalists, like people who were seeking our emancipation and our freedom on all accounts, who aren't, who weren't like the tarot readers or who weren't like, you know, who were across all of these different fields and different points in history and bring them into 
meaningful uh, association with the cards so that people, um, I think social media, of course, like makes us forget history. It has us have a really short attention span. It overwhelms our capacity. It, the, the reading rates are lowering. Do you know what I mean? Like people's ability to focus are lowering. And so I wanted to push, you know, against that and like also um, remind people of, of the wisdom that I exist within the lineage that I exist within the teachers that have really taught me, but so many. And so I love seeing your work and like furthering um, and associating all of these historic moments of like liberation and acts that can be centered and, and brought into conversation with the reading of the cards, because of course our social lives are comprised and, and affected by the context within which we exist and the histories with which um, we intimately carry as well, you know? And so, um, so thank you. Yeah. I'm so excited to, to see your work, our works together in the world. I'm so happy to have them on our bookshelves, on the bookshelves mm -hmm. together. You know what I mean? Um, it, it really is an honor. And so, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. you guys we're both saying made me think of, um, there's an astrologer that I really love, Carolyn Casey, and she often talks about tarot and astrology as a language and mm -hmm. language shifts and changes. So, um, you know, as as time passes and things change in the world, the meanings of words change or words come in and out of vogue or, you know, things like that. And so I think that it's interesting to think of spiritual practices like astrology and tarot as this sort of changeable, malleable thing that we have a hand in shaping how we look at it, whether we want to look at it from a huge overarching historical perspective or from something that's like deeply personal. Um, it's interesting to me when I go back and read, I'm sure you guys do this too, read old like tarot guide books or things from decades <laughs> past and you're reading it and you're like, wow, this is really gendered. This is really, you know, and you know, now I know so many readers who have such a wider view of what some of these maybe more gendered cards mean, historically speaking. Um, and so I think it's interesting the way that modern tarot allows the language to shift a lot more. Like there's a lot more fluidity in how the cards are like depicted, interpreted, all of it. And I think that's super interesting to think of it as sort of a language as opposed to, I don't know, some... A lot of people that used to come into the shop were kind of afraid of tarot decks. They likened them to like a Ouija board or something. And I'm like, oh no, they're just cardstock. Like, are you afraid of business cards? You don't need to be afraid of these. Like they're just paper. Um, the thing that's really valuable about them is that they are a language that is useful for introspection and grounding and reflection and understanding. You know, that's the really powerful piece about tarot. And I like that it's this sort of changeable language. And I like the radical direction that the language is changing in. Well, I think too, the, um, the materiality of producing a deck or a book again, is like such an endeavor and accomplishment. And so I'm happy like I that, you know, you're here because, <laughs> you know, I, I maybe I'll make a tarot deck one day, who knows, but like that being the endeavor, I, like writing about tarot and reading tarot is one thing, but actually creating the deck that makes it all possible, the decks that make it all possible, that puts cards into people's hands. Um, I love, I love engaging the fear that people have around tarot. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm so here for it. Um, but the viscerality of like creating this image that like somehow adds to um like a material visual archive that these cards exist within a lineage of and in conversation with like art history across culture that gets compressed into the moment into the specificity of that person's unique time and socio location and question you know and body um and 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 providing that to people and providing um doing that work of of making a deck that gets used and like exist within a lineage of again like this conversation visually as well like the visual language of tarot you know and so um I'm, I'm curious how you felt Sarah perhaps like how your your deck like was in reading Lane or I's book like are any other modern tarot reader radical tarot reader like how some of these readings maybe have had you relate to your own decks 
um, differently or in a new light or anything like that? Oh yeah, there's a lot of tarot writers and and tarot readers that I follow and whatnot. And you know, sometimes it's just as simple as hearing them, you know, say something on a podcast or you read something in a book and you're like, oh, I never even considered this like extended meaning of this card or that this card mm -hmm. could also encompass dot dot dot. Mm -hmm. Um, and so yeah, it does shape. I find that my definition for a lot of, or how I visualize a lot of cards expands the more and more, you know, I read or learn about tarot. That's what I mean. It's very like flexible mm -hmm. and uh, it's, you kind of never stop learning it. I've been doing tarot informally since I was like a child, just like I got a deck at Spencer's at the Ohio <laughs> Valley mall. Um, and you know what I was like in middle school. And so, yeah, like, what I knew then versus what I know now, like you just keep, it just keeps growing. I mean, I'm almost 40 now and I'm still doing it and still learning about it. Um, <clears throat> and I think you should make a deck. I think everybody should make a deck because <laughs> you will never understand your view of tarot better than when you have to make the card for it. You will learn what cards you are stuck on when you're like, shit, what do I make? for? Oh, can I cuss on this? Uh, what can I do <laughs> for this card? You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I actually I will not make a deck. I I'm always like people kept saying, "Is this going to be a deck?" And I, it's not a deck on purpose for me. I I've said it in the book. I was like, artists have been doing the work. Artists have been doing their part. Artists are doing it all as far as like bringing new lenses, new meanings, new faces, new like cultural context and everything to the cards. And I just feel like because we live in capitalism, right, then what happens is people feel like they can buy the change that they want to see, that the deck is going to speak for them, that the deck is going to, it's like, well, now I have this deck that depicts, you know, queer, BIPOC, disabled people. And so I'm good. I'm done. I'm, I have the perfect inclusive deck or whatever and then so that's it that's I've done like now I'll just go about my tarot yeah. readings using that deck and it's like if you're reading them the same way if you're treating clients still with like this lens of heteronormativity of binary gender of just social expectations of like yeah you should apply for this job you should get married whatever then the deck i mean has it like you're just ignoring the car and seeing the old rider wade smith or whatever it is that's in your right. head um when you look at the cards and reading them the same way so my book is really about calling not just readers but purchasers of tarot decks, <laughs> you know, collectors, reviewers, teachers, clients, everybody um, into responsibility and accountability for what you're actually doing um, mm -hmm. with these cards. I think, you know, I absolutely agree with you. I admire artists. Mm -hmm. I am not an artist. And, um, you know, I think the artists have got it. The artists are good. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I'm concerned um, about all the other participants in tarot mm -hmm. culture and space, you know, publishers too. It's like, we can do more to make sure um, that it's not the same old faces who are teaching, who are getting published, who are, you know, deciding what the correct meanings are and all of this stuff like right. you know it's it's there's plenty of room for activism within just this tiny little sphere yeah. and I would love for people to really truly engage with that write to the tarot publishers and be like I don't see any trans folks represented I don't see any trans people of color represented in your publishing house and I mean editors I don't just mean like one artist on one deck. I'm talking about like, who's making decisions, right? And push for that and push like that. And not that it's just about identity because we can go off on a whole other tangent about that. I think your, Christopher, your chapter on justice is so relevant right now. <laughs> um, I'm just, you know, diversity and inclusion has its limits clearly, right? Like um, right. just new, like, like I said in my book, new faces on the cards, new faces in the seats of power doesn't mean that that power is held differently. And that right. is what we want to see. Right. And there's just, there's, it's like, 
just doing it in the realm of tarot, writing publishers, writing reviews, uplifting, inviting people to conferences, whatever it is, um, paying Roma tarot readers, uh, like honoring Romani people, all of these things that we could be doing, you know, not not being out there being like, well, I'm not a fortune teller. I'm going to distance myself from, you know, low class uh, cardomancers and have tarot be this special elite thing. Um, we cannot do that. <laughs> and we can uplift, um, you know, black cardomancers, Romani cardomancers, uh, fortune tellers. And um, there's so just so much we could do just in this sphere and then see those changes in our lifetimes pretty easily, I think. I mean, we already are starting to see right. and get a taste for um, what it takes and and the power that we can have to make change together. Hmm. I mean, I again, I so uh, I so agree, obviously, and appreciate that. And I'm also so <laughs> in love, like with North Atlantic, my publisher, you know, for my experience with them. Um, because as, as uh, all of the fields, they're, they're primarily, you know, I come, my background is in education and, um, white women dominate that space, educational space. And I find, I found that to be the same within the spiritual realm, the people who get published, the people who are seen as an authority, um, the people who get platformed. And so a part of, again, the work of Red Tarot and just, the the freedom and like support that I found within my publisher was so affirming and also like to be to be put on by Alice Barkley Cat, the writer of postcolonial astrology, who of course is amazing. Um, and then again to see your work and like your um support of so many other people doing the work, like so many other writers and readers and teachers and all that you've listed, um, is so inspiring. It's so heartening to see. You know, and so again, I'm like just happy to be here in conversation um, and to see that history, like uh, radical movement history in print, you know, and again, in association with the history that is tarot, right? Because um, I do love how it is high and low class. I like fucking with that. I mean, a part of yes. like, I love the association of the low culture, but also like, Yes, it's been called that my book is slightly dense or whatnot, but it's like, again, because that's something that I've also always had to um, work against in terms of um, this description that like, how, you know, what kind of diction are you supposed to use like brown person? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, are, right. how dare you be so articulate kind of a thing, you know? And I'm like, totally. that's what happens when you read <laughs> books, you get your, your, your vocab changes, you know? And then at the same time, like taking that, quote unquote, reserved or sometimes academic um, literacy and bringing it to the people and like having that translate and be directly applied to, um, again, the working class lives, to queer lives, to all these people ver where normally it goes in the other direction, where academics and researchers are making theories about people of color and their lived experience and only keeping it in the reserve of the institution and the ivory tower. And those people still are discredited and not seen as authority makers or knowledge producers. Um, and so any, so I feel that tarot also can like reverse or work against that kind of um, direction of, of knowledge production and control as well. I agree with that. I think it's also very accessible. And this is one of the ways that tarot has been used in radical spaces for a long time is like, let's be honest, not everybody has the access to be able to go talk to a therapist every week. I mean, just real talk. I mean, I have insurance and it's still stupid expensive to go do it. And it's a privilege to have insurance, but it's still like too expensive for me to do it as much as I'd like to. So like, Real talk and capitalism, like tarot is something that is accessible to a lot of people to be able, it's it's not a replacement for treatment uh, in, in some cases or things like that, but it is accessible to a lot of people to be able to do a lot of reflection and grounding exercises and things like that. And I think that it is what you're saying about how it's sort of like high low in terms of how we access tarot. Um, I agree completely. I mean, it, it's something that uh, 
12 year old kid can go pick up a deck at Spencer's and start playing with it. Like, just like that. And then there's people who have, you know, invested their whole life and lots of time and money and resources into doing tarot. You know, it's, it's accessible mm -hmm. across a wide range. Mm -hmm. It's part of the beauty of it. And it demands that ethic, you know, as well. It demands that level of like that manner and mode of engagement, you know, um, I, I I'm so here for it. And that's, I mean, I'm a reader, you know, and I have like, I would say commensurate prices with my experience and whatnot, but at the same time at events for the public, it like mar at like uh, markets, if you will, you know, just like a farmer's market kind of a thing. Um, yeah, very accessible <laughs> prices because people don't know that they're necessarily going for a reading necessarily. They may feel called to it. And the, the therapeutic value um, of those readings are important. And I know that Blaine, you have a big focus on, moving beyond just solely, you know, personal reflection or whatnot in, in that mode. Um, and so that's why, again, I'm excited by these works because writing Red Tarot for me has, was helpful to get a grip on a certain level of articulation in being able to connect um, these bigger, you know, histories of oppression and strategies and avenues for liberation into the reading with a person in that moment that I can give them like actionable takeaways um, as well as hopefully provide them a perspective that situates their personal struggle to to beyond, you know, to more like to, to their collective struggle, to the collective struggle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope it's clear. Like, I'm not degrading personal inner <laughs> inner work. It's just sort of like I always push where I feel like pushing is needed yeah. to get to the right balance. That's like Sagittarius temperance, right? <laughs> it's like, I'm going to fight everybody. <laughs> Not because I changed my mind or because I'm a devil's advocate, but it's like to get the proportion right, because it is high and low, like it is um, inner and outer, right? And it's mm -hmm. like, if it's going too far in one direction, then you push the other way, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And I think the chariot really reminds me of that too, not mm. just temperate. It's just like, I think of the chariot as a pendulum swinging. And I was thinking about that while you were talking about the, the high, low, like, like, yes, tarot has been um, degraded. Fortune telling has been degraded and there's no reason why it shouldn't be studied in academia. And like, I would <laughs> like totally want you as my professor of tarot <laughs> studies at you know uc santa cruz or whatever like that would be a dream course awesome. right? yeah <laughs> like yes i'm not saying like i'm not a oh you know fuck every anything that's like elite beautiful <laughs> expensive luxurious like so i am sometimes but it's like you know so that's my problem right like that's my problem to deal with personally but like um yeah it's not about trying to what am i trying to say it's not about trying to like make everything one thing right like that's that's like what we keep coming back to about like the flexibility and complexity or whatever it's like mm -hmm. um colonialism and white supremacy really loves to create these binaries and like we are constantly trying to break them mix them <laughs> you know um and yeah i i think it's i was i wanted to talk about this about the chariot specifically because i just found it so fascinating that the three of us have this view of the chariot as being fluid and perpetual motion as opposed to the quote unquote traditional meeting that's very um, like goal oriented, hard discipline, like single, single focus. And like we all had such an opposite um, reading of that, I think partly because we're all so informed by astrology. So like it really matters to us that that card is associated with cancer and ruled by the moon. Um, but I just, that is the card that I drew for today, for this mm -hmm. full moon that we're experiencing, for for specifically for what is happening at the DNC. Um, mm -hmm. And it gave me chills because it's the same card that I drew um, at Biden's inauguration. And I had a lot of big emotions and fear um, around the inauguration because, you know, January 6th had just happened and um I was like 
um, what do I, like in prepper mode, honestly, <laughs> like I was just like really fearful. Um, and I drew the chariot and I was like, well, this either means like that driven goal directed, like be ready to go <laughs> or that more fluid, like find your center and self-regulate kind of, um, energy of just like where like things are stormy, right. Inner and outer. And what is my, what is like, what is the point that dictates what my compass is like, what, what decides for me, like where I go, right. Mm -hmm. Could be your moral compass or whatever, whatever you want to call it. And, um, I don't know, like, I'm not saying that this was a, a reading for the collective or whatever. I don't really do that because I don't really understand how a reading would apply to masses of people the same, but everybody's really in different okay. communities. But um, for me, for that card to come up both times, it's just like, just such a reminder of um, mm -hmm. fluidity and change and the things that don't change, like that moral center, that spiritual center that you can always um, mm. ground yourself in to ride the waves and just sort of like turn down the noise and find direction. And I just like, I don't know, I, because we were talking, Sarah, I used your deck specifically and I just, um, I don't know. It just really made me think about our, our movements because so what what you have written on here, um, it's about, it's about sharks and about how sharks have to be in perpetual most motion to to survive and it just really made me think about um radicals on the left being seen as these dangerous you know terrorist <laughs> um beings <laughs> i guess i'll say like sharks right and it's like just for doing what we need to do to stay alive showing that there are things that we need to do to stay alive instead of just sort of you know going along with business as usual um, and that, you know, we, we have to be in perpetual motion, whatever, whatever happens, whether the police, um, do a repeat of 1968 and beat the shit out of everybody at the DNC, or if they completely, um, change tactics and do a token, like we're listening to you sort of thing to appease everybody, whatever the, whatever happens, we can't stop, right? Like we can't we have to be in perpetual motion. We have to follow our moral center and not be tossed side to side by, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things that appear to be something that they're not, or, or like, whatever. I don't, I don't know. Um, I would love your feedback on that, but I just, I just, it really struck me the agreement that we all had and sort of the complexity and fluidity and um, flexibility of the chariot as opposed to that tip more typical like focused goal oriented linear kind of like drive hmm. sarah yeah, I, yeah. when i when I, I when i did the card it's yeah sharks they have to move or they or they die that's how they breathe you know um the water passes through their gills and that's how they're able to breathe and there is some cancer energy definitely does inform my understanding of tarot um i don't know if it, this is very common but for me i learned about astrology first before tarot so like yeah me too yeah i i tend to find that it a lot of times it goes the other way more people get into tarot first than astrology mm -hmm. i don't think it matters either way um but for me how i learned tarot was through astrology so it was easy for me to think of like oh cancer energy and we think of cancer water energy as being like very still like lakes and streams and it's very serene and whatnot and it's like no but water can also be a hurricane mm -hmm. it can also be you know what i mean water can move things when it needs to and i think of that as more the energy of the chariot and it is um about movement but i think it's more about learning how to maintain your center while letting momentum carry you um because things are always going to be moving and like you're never going to stop that movement and we always have to be moving 
Uh, it's part of our imperative as living things that we will move until we don't move anymore, until we make our transit to the eighth house, so to speak, um, for astrology people. Mm -hmm. But it's it's one of those things where, yeah, it's definitely informed by a more like heart-centered place. Like we think of cancer energy as being very like heart-centered in some ways. I, I don't know. I always think of it as very protective and nurturing and um but sometimes it can be protective in that like mama lion way, you know what I mean? Which is kind of fierce. And so the chariot to me carries like that kind of energy. And I do think it's an interesting pull for like what's going on. I mean, for your personal pull, <laughs> like for what's going on right now, because things are just like, by the day I open the news and I'm just like, what fresh hell awaits me? Um, and so, yeah, when everything feels that like tumultuous, and like, it's just churning all the time. Like that feels like chariot energy to me. It's not always this like linear goal oriented point A to point B thing. Sometimes it's just movement for the sake of movement. And it can be for a lot of reasons. It can be for rage. It can be for, you know, whatever. But mm. yeah, the chariot I think feels different to me than some of the older, more traditional, I guess, definitions that I've read for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that you brought sharks into the imagery of the chariot. I just got done teaching about animals and and sea country and the cards and, um, of course, like decolonization requiring an animal ethic and realizing animals are are um, active agents of decolonization as well, right? Is in seeing the whales <laughs> resisting, you know what I mean? Like our our allies, our comrades, um, and so thinking thinking of that with the sharks is is fantastic. Um, it's so interesting. I mean, I think chariot is well, and like that coming up for you and its association with cancer, one cancer can be very, is like in, um, you know, in a larger, like not to the personal astrology, though, I mean, it may manifest to a degree, but can be very nationalistic, you know, in it coming up with a convention, it's like, who is on the end, who is home chariot is home, who am I? fighting this war on behalf and like the epigraph in which I open the chariot section. I mean, I'm a, I have a lot of Scorpio in me, so I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, I like there to be layers. I don't necessarily, I like opacity thinking of glissant, you know what I mean? Like I like there to be vulnerability, but also like things that like plant the seed for again, like pivoting readings in the future. And the opening epigraph is from, um, um, oh, why am I forgetting his name right now? Um, New York Times <laughs> writer. Uh, oh my gosh, you want a polar surprise? Wesley Morris, sorry. Wesley Morris writing about going and seeing the Obama portrait, Kendi Wiley's Obama portrait for the first time and like bringing a parasol. And that, again, like, <laughs> I'm, it's like just a little seed in there in terms of describing it in this lush moment of like movement and arrival and especially the compression in which you walk through the national portrait gallery and you see white man after white man and these stoic poses and then you're met with the lushness um of the obama you know portraits and the brilliance of that and then also like the chariot card itself is a card of war. It's a card of conquering. It's a card of Roman triumph. It's a card of extending empire, which of course that Obama portrait though being stunning in it's arresting of history simultaneously represents like as all presidents do and their aim is, is to extend and expand empire. And so again, I think that that's a power, like that is at play and it coming up for you and like and determining who the next leader of our empire is going to be. Um, and then at the same time, um, you know, like what I focused on in the writing is like, how do we find a vehicle for movement? Like this thing that gets us from feeling stranded, like whether that's moving your hips, like having, you know, a gay sachet as you're walking through the world to feel empowered and the click of your heels or something, you know what I mean? Or um, the friend that you're talking with, like the waters, I mean, it is the moon, we're under a full moon, like even if you were to stay still sitting down, you are moving through time and space. We are never stationary. We are never sing like at a still point necessarily. And so um, how do we move with like knowing when we've outgrown a shell, you know? I mean, 
like so many people obviously were so invested in the Obama presidency at, at that time. It was such a like vehicle, right, for change and for hope and all the things. And of course, we've outgrown that. And I think what um, I think both of our books work and aim to do is like you get a different sense of pace and scope when you ground yourself in history. You get a different sense of endurance because you know that these are not new occurrences um, right. and you get like a different response in order in handling like crisis and dysregulation. You get a better sense of how of learning how to regulate yourself, which, um, yeah, which I know you wrote about <laughs> as well. But Sherry. I love that the idea of cancer as home, too. That's such a good like. Takeaway for that pool also, because, yeah, cancer is the fourth house, it's home in astrology and so to have that come up around some of the political stuff it's like yeah I can told I never even considered that that it could be like an extension of empire like what is home now well it's a, it's an emotional sense of safety it's like I think it's it's especially like your emotion like with water being your emotions I think of it too as like you know what is your emotional home base mine happens to be aries <laughs> and that's emotional home base is for sure <laughs> anger <laughs> and, uh, you know i too lost my home to fire um you know when i was really 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 young and yeah it's i don't know yeah i think you know yeah so much comes up in terms of like the feeling of safety versus the actuality of safety which we like security like actual material security which you would find with the opposite capricorn you know with mm -hmm. the feeling of safety and like who deserves to feel safe at the expense of other people's unsafety like on insecurity right mm -hmm. um and there's just so much insecurity um unhoused people here all the way to people's houses and homes and whole um land being bombed and destroyed for a feeling of safety for certain people right and it's just like we really i think have to grapple with the relationship between that we have between like feelings and relationship and connection like i just I never, I don't know. I, like you were talking about earlier, Sarah, for, for a long time, I used tarot as an atheist and I didn't believe there was anything spiritual about it. I was just like, it is a good thing to introduce a little chaos, a little randomness um, into your processing to like get you unstuck, right? Like, and I treated it that way and my readings probably kind of sucked for that reason. But, um, you know, the spirituality came up from below for me it was not like a top-down church kind of thing it was my experience with cards that it was over a long time I finally fucking got it like it's not random you know so what 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 is this then and I also you know just learning the elements right where it took me a long time to realize that cups are emotions but also spirituality because those things are related like if I if I have like intimacy issues, right? With other people, I'm going to have the same blockages around spirit, spirituality and spirit, right? It's like, if I'm feeling like I want to be self-protective and keep my distance from people, then I am also going to have that relationship to spirit, right? And it's just like those things interrelationship i mean that's sort of like at the core of what i'm writing about um in the book too with with the high priestess and justice the twos is like in our relationships with each other are the basis of spirituality because we're interconnected we do owe something to one another there's no such thing as being like it's just such a colonized like binary to have you know, mind and body, or you and me, or you know, us and them, um, the sacred and profane. There's no spirituality without our lived experience, without history, without the material things that we're doing. And so I get, um, you know, as I said in the book, it's not hard to predict that liberation focus spirituality will be like a branding thing that can lose all meaning right but it's like 
having just sort of the witchy equivalent of thoughts and prayers is not um, a spirituality that is materially connected. And, and I think we all are invested in spirituality that is connected to material reality, tapping into actual possible revolutionary potential, actually impacting the lives of people, not just sort of like, let's feel good doing our collective spells for liberation. And what is the effect of that? It's not measurable. So we'll just keep doing it and feel good. Okay. I'm not saying it's bad to feel good, but typically, um, when you're learning magic, we'll just say magic practitioner, and there's various, many various different cultural contexts for that. You try something and you see a result. It's very scientific, right? It is very scientific. It is, you, you try something and it's like, did your spell work? Did that person fall in love with you? Did you get that money? Did you, you know, what the fuck happened? Right. And, um, if nothing measurable happened or you can't see any result then you're not like well I'll just keep doing it right you're like I didn't do it correctly or the spell didn't work or whatever and I just think I I, I just I have concerns about um where politics and spirit get connected in a superficial way that's more about like words and branding and image as social media and capitalism uh veers towards and and lose um the material reality that many of us have experienced is possible with magic but the magic is not in sort of something supernatural doing something for you at least that's not been my experience my very first spell was was for my own protection, it was a banishing spell. This person who was texting me many, many times a day, expected immediate response, just was like, I lived in absolute fear of hearing from this person. I did the banishing spell and I didn't hear from them for three months, um, which was just so shocking to me. Um, but that wasn't the actual magic. The magic was when I finally did hear from them, having that break allowed me to break off that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, it, it like allowed me to see another way that was possible, that I didn't just have to live in fear and just constantly placating this person to hopeful, so they would hopefully, you know, stay satisfied and leave me alone. Mm -hmm. I was like, I could actually just end this relationship. Um, with this person and I didn't have the courage to do that until I had this ineffable break you know of this person just didn't contact me for months with no explanation and no when they did contact me they didn't acknowledge that any time had passed they were just like whatever like picked up like nothing had happened and it was so bizarre and that is that is magical but the real magic I think is what I then did after right I set I finally fucking learned to set a boundary and not let somebody like take over my life like that and and do what needed to be done and I just feel like I I'm so often seeing people wanting a magic that just takes care of things for you and is not instead just sort of a, like a road opener for you to do what you need to do and i just hope that's why my book is so focused on action um just because i see that as the piece that is missing <laughs> from so much i guess people are calling it spiritual activism now whatever uh, that's the piece that i see missing is that the the prayers and spells are the activity in itself or the reading tarot is the activity in itself. And that is not it. As far as I'm concerned, that is not the whole of it. Um, if you disagree, please chime in. But um, I just like, I want to see material impact. Um, in, in P if there, if people are going to call themselves activists, spiritual activists, I want to see impact. Mm -hmm. Efficacy right um that measure of efficacy i so i mean and likewise wanting to write a book um and maintain a certain caliber of language and engagement with the ideas because the way that it gets co-opted the way that it has it is co being co-opted you know what i mean it's marketable yeah. now it's like right. have throw anything's decolonial decolonial i'm like 
right have you read any history decolonial and that's right. why i wanted to like <laughs> keep you know red tarot to a certain level because it's like you know you have to also put in the work to like sit and think and unpack <laughs> these things and it's not just like the simple like solidarity is quite complicated and a lot of my book focuses on the tension amidst um like of course dealing with white supremacy but against brown black and brown and native communities and the tensions that exist in trying to establish solidarity amidst them because they're not equatable it's not just like one banner uniting us all like we are all, all of course wanting to get free but like the histories and the strategies and the methods towards those are distinct and complicated and need a full treatment and engagement of such that then inform the kind of actions that we take you know and um i would i would say that the whole process for you is magical in terms of like you setting that boundary but also like you taking magical action i think is also a part of that agency that you were claiming for yourself yeah. you know what i mean absolutely and so i find um that for me, like tarot reading and my own ritual practices, which have been like a part of Red Tarot too, was like you theorizing and and sharing personally and hopefully modeling um, how tarot is a type of processes for me spiritually for what has been ruptured and those relationships that, um, yes, like I'm very wary Scorpio all the time. You know what I mean? I'm very like <laughs> with my with my peering eye over things. Uh, very suspicious, <laughs> you know, of a lot of things is rightfully so probably. Um, and, and, and very private about my own magical ritual practices, but they are very integral. And for me, like strength comes up um, in terms of working with divinity, working with spirit, working with certain deities, with prayers, with mantras, with candles, things that keep my inner resolve with a degree of solidity that allows me to go out into the world and 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 maintain that um that sense of support even if it's not always of course and so often it will not be always obviously visible like you're often we will often feel under resourced and under supported and without resources so we do need to cultivate an ability to see the unseen or work with the unseen in order again to like help us take actionable <laughs> steps and live in alignment and in integrity so that's what I'd add to that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. What I meant was like when I heard back from this, when I heard back from her mm -hmm. after like three months, I could have been like, oh, the spell wore off. And so uh, like, yeah. let me do another spell. Let me do another spell. Let me do another spell to keep her away from me. Right. Uh, but like, yeah. so, but that that's what I meant by the magic being the action that I took. Like all of it was the magic for sure. But like, you can get in a cycle of like, it's not working anymore. It's not working anymore. I need to do it again. Like I need to just yeah. like get the favor of spirit or whatever, like however you conceptualize it um, mm -hmm. to keep safe or keep, you know, for me it was about protection, but like, you know, yeah. be in a cycle of just um, kind of spinning your, your wheels when mm -hmm. really part of the magic is, yeah, developing your yourself your own resolve your own strength finding your own power um mm -hmm. and and realizing you know i think uh expanding your sense of agency about what you can do mm -hmm. i think are we taking questions i think i so yeah, we do okay. have some questions coming in and i think now's also a good moment to remind folks that if you've been kind of holding on to a question, please put it in the Q&A for us. We'd love to have it. Um, so yeah, there were a couple of people right off the bat who were very interested to hear um, what decks resonate with y'all. Um, Benjamin noted that the collective Terra deck was one of the first that had a big impact on them. Um, but yeah, if you'd be willing to just share a little bit about the decks that y'all are using and appreciating. Uh, so I, I have one of the original Spirit Speak decks from Mary Evans. I don't know if you guys uh, are familiar with Mary's work. Um, it's this very like, I don't know how to describe the drawings. They, they look almost uh, like a kid did them or something. I don't know. I'm just obsessed with her artwork style. Uh, so I, I like pretty much anything Mary Evans does. The, the Apparition deck, Spirit Speak, Davina, I'd say she's one of my favorite deck illustrators I just really dig her illustration style um 
And then there was another one that I got not long ago and I haven't used it yet, but I'm just obsessed with the artwork in it. Uh, it was from Nicholas Bruno. He suffers from sleep paralysis. And so every card image is, it's photography that he does and it is really unsettling. And it's like depicted by things that were shown to him in sleep paralysis for each of the cards. And um, oh. it, it's the, ins uh, the Somnia Tarot. That's, I was like, the name is escaping me, but it has something to do with sleep. Um, Somnia Tarot, Tarot is another really good one. Mm. Fantastic. Obviously, uh, Sarah's tarot deck here. We've got to <laughs> just put on all of them turning terrestrial tide tarot. Just got to obviously shut that up. Um, I love I've been using I, I, I have a Libra moon, I will say, and I'm very Venusian. Um, and so <laughs> I do enjoy cultivating a, a, a curated deck collection because of the engagement with art and like putting in people's hands. So I'll say that. And it's what I do. So I give myself a little bit of license. But I've been loving Ritual Tarot by Tierra May is very striking. Um, the Star Spinner Tarot by um, Trungles has been a mainstay in my practice and like for clients. And it's um, like it has like a, you know, a warm and inviting like color palette and looks like cute and whatnot. But it, the actual myths and like stories that are embedded within are actually very powerful. And it's kind of like a secret hitter, if you will. Like it's got like, it'll gut punch you without that being what you anticipate, you know? And then lastly, um, the Tarot Yohoali Hekal deck um, by uh, Chikome. It's Kuntli, it's Kuntli Amatlapatli. Um, I love for like being a Mesoamerican centric centered deck. Uh, yeah, for me, the Numinous Tarot by Cedar McLeod is a mainstay for me, sort of like the very first um, deck that I backed on Kickstarter as like, a, oh, this, I just want to support this artist. And it's not like the kind of art that I'm drawn to at all, but just found that this deck is like queer auntie warm hug vibes. Like, and I don't always go for that. I tend to be more like, you know, just give me the hard truth, give it to me, you know, you know, unvarnished, right? Um, but occasionally I am also a Libra moon and <laughs> secret romantic. And so I, ha I have my uses for that one. <laughs> um, then um, I have been really loving um, Tarot of the Cosmic Seed by Lelania Simone, which I find very, very beautiful. It's a collage deck. I'm a super snob about collage decks. I collage is like a special favorite art form for me that deck is so gorgeous um and just reads really really well for me and like the I love that you know the there's lots of gender swapping in the courts there's just like everything I love it's it's beautiful I love it so much and also um Emily Lubanko's Lubanko um, tarot, which you can't get now, so sorry to mention one that's out of print, but um, it's very intense, um, very visceral and dark, and I love that one too. <laughs> oh, I just thought of one more. Um, Charlie Claire Burgess did Fifth Spirit Tarot. Amazing. I love Fifth Spirit Tarot. I actually it's did not really fun. connect with Fifth Spirit, but the newer one, the Gay Marseille, oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. I think I just like like the images to take up more space. Like I think the with me, the Fifth Spirit, like there was too much like white space. Um, the figures were kind of small, and it's just like the uh, yeah the the Marseille version is so bold and takes up all the space, and it's super super queer, and it's really fun, and I love that one too. Yeah, Charlie's work is great. So, and those you can get; those are available. Yeah, those are <laughs> cool. What maybe sticking with the topic of um, tarot art? Uh, there was a question here from Graf, um, <clears throat> specifically for you, Sarah, uh, about the source images, um, uh, which are very zine style, um, and a question just sort of like um, how how did you uh how did you come by those images did you take any of them um yeah and just a lot of love for the beautiful aesthetic oh thank you yeah i used to make zines in high school um as most weird queer kids did um so yeah a lot of my decks have that like collage style um 
Yes, to both. So I did take some of the images that are in there and then just knocked the color out of them in Adobe or in Procreate to make everything like that black and white scale so that's like consistent. Uh, the other thing you can do if you are new to collage or mixed media projects is um, there are websites that host royalty free uh, images. Artists can put their work up there to be used however you want to use it. Uh, so it's things like, um, oh, I wish I, uh, like Unsplash, I think is the name of one of the websites. Um, there's quite a few that are like that. And so some of the images, yeah, like I used some pictures of whales. We talked about whales in this and we love Gladys the whale and all of the work that they are doing, um, as anti-capitalist animal allies. Uh, and so there are some whales in the deck and like, obviously I don't have pictures of whales. So I <laughs> took those from Unsplash and digitally altered them myself. So some are mine, some are ethically and responsibly sourced from the internet. Please do not steal work that you are not licensed to use uh, is the, I guess the statement I, I have to give here. Fantastic. Um, cool. So pulling another question here um, from Beth, uh, who kind of was pulling on a thread in the conversation earlier. So we can kind of roll back to that. Um, <clears throat> uh, Beth said, um, as we learn uh, how to read and practice tarot differently through your books, how do we as tarot readers and practitioners shift our offerings and collaborations to prioritize material collective impact? Um, I'm learning to read differently, and I'd like some advice for going beyond one-on-one -on -one readings to expand what I'm learning and share it with my communities in ethical, connective ways. Well, I would just love to share what we're doing in Baltimore. Um, mm, I did not start yes. this group, but I'm a member of Solidarity Tarot, and uh, it was started by some queer Black folks here um, in a in a space that was already radical, it was that it was like kind of filtered for radical folks, queer folks to start with, which really really helps. It's not what it's not, wasn't just like oh tarot folks meet at Barnes and Noble or something. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> filtered to be you know um, people who are, are are largely in alignment in certain ways, um, just by the nature of the fact that it's a radical bookstore. But um, so we meet together and we do collaborative readings where it's not one on one. It's um, depending on the size of the group, we might do it as a whole group or we might do it in smaller groups. But um, and we have uh, just a couple of people volunteer to to facilitate the next meeting and basically do whatever they want. Um, so so, for example, the last meeting we had, a couple of people had volunteered to lead a, a meeting on spreads, just talking about what tarot spreads are. And they had us do this super fun activity. Um, they just handed out index cards and was like, write down like a, a question or, or whatever that you would want to be a position in a tarot spread. And then we got in small groups, there was like 20 people there and um, just kind of mixed and matched people's index cards to create a spread that was a mix of, mm -hmm. of things that, um, that people, um, had come up with and then pull cards for them. And then usually when we read together, we everybody's the querent and everybody is the reader at the same time. So it's like, we're just kind of like negotiating, not in a like a hostile way. I just mean like we're together interpreting based on our own experiences, our own understandings of the cards. Maybe there's disagreement, maybe there's not, but just sort of negotiating what the meaning could be um, together. And it's so fun and so energizing. And um, I just really like, if there's one thing that people do after reading my book, I hope it's that they start little groups, <laughs> little just autonomous groups to read tarot together. And um, I just think it's awesome for building trust with with folks. Like it's a really, really great way to build relationships and trust. And I just know like, if we're gonna take like real action, political action, like take real political risks, we have to be with people that we trust, right? We're not gonna take larger risks until we feel um, supported to do that. And that requires being in trusting relationship with others that we're putting ourselves at risk with. And it's never too early to build those trusting relationships. And I have just found like, this is such a great way 
to build those networks of trust and support because you're like spiritually aligned, politically aligned, um, and you're getting to know each other really fairly intimately in these in these negotiations about card meanings um, pretty quickly, actually. So um, that is something um, I think anybody can do anywhere. I mean, you could do it on Zoom, whatever is accessible to you, right? I mean, but um, just finding your people and building trust so that if and what not if when shit does go down like you have your people you know um and you know you know what each what what each other is about and um yeah i mean we we explicitly make it political like we do collaborative readings about you know the first one we ever had was about sort of like the wildfires in in maui it was a little over a year ago right so it was just like a lot of just processing feeling processing feelings together which there isn't really a space for that a lot of time that's not like the fucking internet right where anybody can just come in and argue with you right it's just like it was a lot of like emotional processing and just informing each other and there's a lot of like intellectual, emotional, um, relational, spiritual stuff happening all at once when we read cards together like that. And um, yeah, I highly recommend it. Hmm. Like ditto, well said, you hit, I totally agree, <laughs> totally. Yeah, 11 out of 10, no notes. Mutual yeah. <laughs> is the way. <laughs> Taking care of our, our little groups is the way. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, pulling another question from the Q&A. Um, we've got someone who's asking um, about um, teaching tarot to beginners um, and wondering if there are TV shows um, that might be useful uh, in teaching tarot to beginners using pre-existing stories that mimic the 78 lessons found in tarot. Any? That's interesting. That's, on that? I mean, I will say that like generally I am a very like I'm always pulling in somewhat like pop cultural references to relay sometimes harder concepts or like other concepts to to my students and my clients. But I will say that there is um I'm forgetting the deck creator's name and I haven't used it in a while, but I do love it. The Afro Avatar tarot, and it's based on Avatar the Last Airbender. Um and it and it's like <clears throat> they know both the storyline and structure of the show and tarot it's not just one of those like gimmicky like we're just gonna slap on tarot card like you know you're like how is that character supposed to be whatever tarot archetype no it's like they know both of them um and so i wouldn't say necessarily that avatar is like i mean it's split i mean i think avatar steven universe there's shows like that that maybe have like a more emotional spiritual bend like avatar is a is like one of the greatest <laughs> of course shows you know like about empire and colonization and and elements and all the things um i'd recommend that deck and then like from that deck having that lens into tarot but otherwise i don't nest i i find that probably a lot of um representations of tarot on television are like misconstruing and actually something to, to engage critically you know if it's like explicitly like here's a tarot card reader popping up in the episode i mean it's fun but like to learn meaningfully is a little bit different you know Similar to what you said for Avatar, I feel the same way about Twin Peaks. I'm a David Lynch person. Mm. So like Twin Peaks, there are Twin Peaks tarot decks that are out there. And Twin Peaks as a show has a lot of um, Fool's Journey themes, we'll say. Uh, for people who are beginners, the Fool's Journey is often like the walk through the Fool through the Major Arcana, the first 20, uh, 21 cards. And so I feel like Twin Peaks can maybe loosely have a little bit of that. Uh, sort of like a fool's journey feel to it um but yeah it's hard to think like that might make a good show though like if we were ever going to make a tv show maybe someone should make a tv show that's like the fool's journey or something or it's like tarot stories i don't know <laughs> um let's see uh here's a an easy question, which is just, Christopher, could you repeat the name of the tarot deck that you brought up at the very end, the, the Mesoamerican tarot yes. deck? Yes, um, it is tarot, 
like I know it's maybe weird. Yohali, Y O H U A L L I, Ehekal, E H E C A T L. Um, or like Mi Corazon Mexica, I think is also another name they, an artist name they have. They have like multiple names. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Great. That's everything that we had in the Q&A and we're down to our last 12 or so minutes. So I'm wondering if y'all want to kind of um, take us out on any reflections. Um, I loved hearing about how y'all are using tarot in Baltimore. I think if you had any other kind of tidbits for those of us who are joining you remotely, whether that's um, in Baltimore or elsewhere about how y'all are seeing tarot used in community. Um, I think that'd be a great thing to, to leave on or other projects that you're working on is always fun to hear about too. I know Christopher so does fun. community, a lot of community tarot stuff too. I'd love to hear more details about what you all are up to. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's a great, it was like maybe because of the, the like the way the language is, um, of the question, but absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm in San Diego and I do a lot of events in Barrio Logan, um, Libe Lula, which is, uh, an amazing, it's like home. It really is home. I think it's, um, the creator has like cancer placements and it's like cancer is my third house and anyways, but, um, uh, that's where I had my book launch and they have book club and do all kinds of other like literacy events, you know, um, beyond tarot, but also just reading tarot at markets. And like, often you might be the only the only one offering tarot readings, depending on, you know, de it depends. Sometimes you may not be, but I appreciate being that kind of transgressive one um, that others like now the community, you know, like trusts me and like, thankfully I have like communal respect around it. But like first getting here, they were like, what's going on over there? Like very nervous. Um, but again, it's still offering something experiential and otherwise like a market where people are just buying like soaps and other goods and you know what I mean like there's like you're offering definitely something distinct and it can be sliding scale and it really does have like a direct um like it really is just so it's so great it's such like a six of pentacles six of cups kind of a vibe in terms of like you're getting something from the readings that you may be giving in those spaces as well in a very just like dramatic democratic kind of space you know what I mean and it's like or social it's it's a vibe um yeah all kinds of things i would just say like try and do give like in, include tarot and things that aren't ostensibly only tarot relate centric either you know what i mean at like your pride event at like your local brewery like have a tarot set up like at the bookstore like bring your cards like just carry your cards with you <laughs> you know yeah we also do a lot of stuff online too. Like mm -hmm. uh, I used to have a physical store space. Uh, now I work for PM Press. I don't think I, I think I did a, maybe a very bad job on my bio. It's very short, um, <laughs> but I, I work at PM Press now that my shop is no more. Um, and what we ended up doing was having our monthly tarot group that we did converted over to Discord. So even if you're not somewhere physically, because not all of us live in like a major you know, metropolitan area where there are maybe, maybe is a huge community there. Some of us in rural spaces may struggle a little bit to find that community. And that's just real. That's like mm -hmm. what it is to be in a rural space sometimes. Um, but you can do it on things like discord as well, where like once a month we have a group that gets together. We typically like do a tarot spread together, talk about things. It's kind of what Lane was saying about like just the processing of everything. The bulk of us meeting up isn't doing a tarot spread. It's like the processing of everything that is happening all around us all the time right now and trying to figure out like, what do we do about it? Um, and sometimes that's better served in group spaces, even if those people, even if it is digital, even if it's like this, mm -hmm. you know, none of the four of us are in the same, well, no, none of the four of us are in the same city right now, but we're still here like sharing ideas and whatnot. So I think that um, online spaces also do have a lot of value uh, in doing this kind of work also. Absolutely. I actually discussed this in, in the book with the Three of Pentacles about what is community actually. <laughs> and it's like, um, you know, I don't think that it has to be 
necessarily local in person that's not accessible to everybody but at the same time too it's like community isn't just people thrown together with shared interests right that can just as easily be a market right that could be competition it, it could be you know just right like sometimes people mistake tarot the market as for tarot community and that can be really um confusing and hurtful I think we've all experienced that at times where you're like, I thought this person was my friend, but actually they're my competitor who shares interests with me or is like mining me for ideas or whatever kind of thing. And it's just like, oh, that's not what community is. So like, how do you, like I discuss in the book, like how do you, what are the qualities that a community has wherever it is, right? And it's like, it has to involve people caring about each other and caring about the group, right? And um, and having some sort of commitment there too, I think. Um, and that absolutely, yeah, that absolutely can and should happen online. I think a lot of people really crave that. And that's a reason that there's a lot of like class hopping. It's a lot of reason I think people consider themselves to be perpetual students of tarot and be like, oh, I'm still learning, I'm still learning. Because they want to be in the classroom environment with other people. And you don't have to, it's like, it just feels like the only place to go from student is to teacher. And it doesn't have to be that. It does, I just like, that's, I really wanted to bust open the idea that those are the only options is to like, be a student in community with other people class hopping or then you become the expert you become the teacher and then you get to be in community by like being the teacher right it's like we can just do it together <laughs> and um i hear you about like you know in person being inaccessible i for like a lot of tarot community stuff is really really inaccessible to me financially like I cannot take these classes or go to these conferences I, I'm a single parent living under the poverty line in Baltimore City I live on two thousand dollars a month I cannot spend upwards of a hundred dollars on a tarot class ever like there's no way so people would be like who are you I've never seen you in these spaces these online spaces it's like because I can't fucking afford it right and it's just like it would be great to create spaces that don't have to be monetized, which is of course difficult when we're all feeling the pressures of capitalism and have to feel like anything we do is contributing to our security in some way. But I just, I hope people will reframe like what security actually means beyond just sort of like scraping into the middle class if we possibly can i've i mean i've certainly like let go of having white supremacy define the standards of what my life should be and i'm like you know what i my two kids and i can live on two thousand dollars a month i don't need to try to make I don't need to like put all this energy into making more money. What will actually make me feel more secure is having closer community ties. And so I choose to invest in that. Um, and that, you know, it's it, time, time, you know, and money are closely related in our culture, unfortunately, but like that's worth the time to me because it does translate into security that actually things that I can buy don't ever translate into. Mm -hmm. Well said. Y'all, this has been um, a really stimulating conversation. This is the first time we've actually had an open chat in a webinar, and I'm so appreciative of everyone who attended and was kind of re responding and sharing. I know panelists may not have been able to keep an eye on the chat, but Thanks to everybody who was here and was engaged and um, all the beautiful solidarities that people were exchanging with one another um, in the uh, chat. I know awesome. that this will be a thing we'll continue to do. Um, uh, Lane, Christopher, Sarah, it's been such an enormous pleasure. Um, thank you so much. I hope you have uh, a great evening and um, yeah, look forward to being able to host future conversations with each of you. Cool, thank you. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed thank it. You. <laughs> It's been a pleasure and an honor. Congratulations again, Lane. I'm oh, so happy. Thanks. <laughs> Thank Take you care, y'all.